Let us pray. God, we ask your spirit to be with us, to open up our hearts and minds so we can receive what you have to give to us today. In these scriptures, songs we sing, words that are said, help us to know your need for who we are, your desire for who we can become. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So can you imagine if by some miracle of the Holy Spirit, we could understand and be understood today? Even all those speaking different languages. And I'm not just talking languages. I needed a Pentecost moment the other day when I was leaving the office one afternoon and there were like eight or 10 kids playing in our playground or Christina's renamed it to the Pray Ground. And I stopped by, I got out of my car because I wanted to tell the grandpa who was leaning on the fence that Christina had ordered a nice bench to sit out on so they could be there with their grandkids and it was gonna be there next week. And he turned to me and pointed to himself and said, no ingles. And I had to point to myself and say, no hablo espanol. So he called his grandson over and asked if he could interpret for me and explained that his grandpa was from Cuba. And the grandson pointed to the grandma that was sitting on the other side of the playground. She got her granddaughter to come over. And instead of speaking to each other and nobody understanding each other, So the grandma was from Guatemala and she could not speak the same Spanish as the grandpa from Cuba. So none of us could understand each other. I needed a Pentecost moment right there where we could understand and be understood no matter what our native tongue. Can you imagine if those who speak the language of Black Lives Matter and those who speak the language of the Me Too movement and those who speak the language of climate change and those who speak the language of the Democratic Party and those who speak the language of the Republican part, those on both sides of the abortion issue, those on both sides of the immigration issue, those on both sides of gun control issues, instead of talking past each other, and nobody understanding each other, nobody really hearing each other, what kind of miracle of the Holy Spirit would it take to have all of us hear and understand each other? Wouldn't it be great? It would set the world on fire for God. Reverend James Moore talks about a little girl visiting her grandmother one beautiful spring morning and they walked out to the grandmother's flower garden and as the grandmother was inspecting the progress of her flowers, the little girl decided to try and pry open a rosebud with her own two hands. But with no luck, she pulled on the petals. All it did was tear or bruise or wilt or break off completely. And finally, in frustration, she said, Grandma, I just don't understand this at all. When God opens a flower, it looks so beautiful. When I try and do it, it just comes apart. Grandmother said, there's a good reason for that. God is able to do it because he works from the inside out. God works from the inside out. That's the great message of Pentecost Sunday. That's what the disciples finally came to understand at Pentecost. Jesus had ascended into heaven. He told the disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit. And here's where the story of Pentecost picks up. The disciples were back in the upper room waiting and wondering. Some of them were probably grumbling impatiently and nervously. Can you imagine if we just gathered in the sanctuary and waited for 11 days? What would happen? What in the world are we doing? All this waiting's driving me up the wall. There's no use. He's gone. Without him, we are nothing. It's over. We'll just have to face it. 
What is this Holy Spirit business anyway? Maybe we misunderstood him. And just then they heard a sound. The breath of God started to blow in that place like the rush of a mighty wind. Images of fire danced around them. Suddenly, they were not afraid anymore. They had a peace, a confidence, a courage, a strength, a unity that they began to speak and communicate the word of God boldly and amazingly. People from all different backgrounds heard and responded. 3,000 people were converted that day because there's always somebody counting heads. That's where we get it in the Methodist church. I've told the story before of Bishop Kenneth Carter, retired, retired Methodist bishop. I would see him at my annual 3M gatherings in New Orleans in the spring. Those of us working, teaching Bowen's family systems to pastors to help us survive and thrive the emotional intensity of this job. We share the experience of three or four times the normal amount of an emotional events in lives sad and glad than the regular person. And Bishop Carter says, I experienced Pentecost in the most surprising place. 2017, 25 residents in varying stages of Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia, plus six or eight volunteers gathered for worship at the Bethany Memory Care Facility at the Heritage at Loman in Chapman, South Carolina, where his wife was. It says below is a slightly revised blog that I shared at that service, Bishop Carter said, I shared it once more in hopes that we can all experience Pentecost again. How do we tell someone who's lost language comprehensive that we love her? I asked the worship at Bethany, he said, the memory care facility where my wife Linda was a resident for 18 months. Beside me stood a resident whose speech had been reduced to incoherent babbling. She looked into my eyes as though longing to speak. Hug her, came a response from a resident who struggles with hallucinations and is lost and distorted in their memories. So Bishop said, I put my arm around her and she embraced me in return. And looking into her sad eyes, I called her by name and I said, I love you. He said, suddenly the sadness in her eyes turned to sparkle, a faint smile. She said plainly for all to hear, I love you too. Babbling turned to the language of love. It was Pentecost Sunday. We'd been singing such hymns as, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, Kumbaya, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. He said, we heard the story of Pentecost in Acts 2, where people with different languages and cultures and traditions understood one another. Tongues of fire descended on diverse and multilingual people, and God's spirit created a new community. He said, Bethany became a new community as the barriers once again crumbled. Present among the residents were various religious traditions, American Baptists, Assemblies of God, Southern Baptist, Catholic, Episcopal Holiness, Lutheran, Presbyterian, United Methodist, and Jewish. A few claim to religious affiliation. They had none. Some present at the service had forgotten God, no longer remembered who Jesus was. Few had never consciously known God. But he said, we all share common characteristics, Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia. They're at various stages in their disease and they were all were unable to live alone and care for themselves. So he asked, what made it possible for the people present at that Jewish festival to understand one another even though they spoke different languages? I asked them that, he said, and they said, because they loved one another. A resident called out from the back. Conversation followed about how love enables us to understand and accept one another. Other languages are present at Bethany. One couple speaks Portuguese. One's native lung is Spanish. The other's Italian staff member speaks Swahili. A volunteer present speech is French and German. So he said, let's learn to say, I love you in different languages. So we tried to speak words of love in Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, French, German, Swahili, 
with varying degrees of success, and we tried to speak the language of love in multiple language. And it was during those exchanges that the resident's language skills had, who had been destroyed by her disease came and stood beside me. How do we say I love you to somebody who can't understand words? He said there followed a time of practicing love without words, hugs, handshakes, an open hand, a pat on the back, a warm smile, other love languages were mentioned, helping, protecting, encouraging, feeding, bathing, just being with. He said they got it. Beneath all our hyper-cognitive theological talk and creedal statements is the simple reality that God is love. To love is to know God. Pentecost happens when people express the multiple languages of love. And the worshipers of Bethany are a microcosm of our world, he says. They're black and white and brown. They're Christian, Jewish, and none of the above. Their behaviors are sometimes offensive and difficult. Intellectual abilities vary broadly. For some, the filters are gone and they cross boundaries of affection and relationships. Some have been highly skilled professional people. Others have a background of common labor. And they're just like the rest of us. He said, as I listen to the rancor in our society and churches and the talk in the United Methodist Church of dividing as a denomination, I pray we learn and practice the languages of love. One thing that binds us all together is that we are God's beloved people. Within the embrace of love you from the worshiper at Bethany on Pentecost Sunday is another voice. It was God's Holy Spirit speaking the language of greater love, declaring to all of us, I know you by name. I have redeemed you. You are mine. We are surrounded by God's ever-present love. Sharing that love in simple acts of kindness, compassion, justice is our highest calling. And the Holy Spirit has many meanings. Essentially, it's here to explain to us how we got through a time in our life when you didn't think you were going to make it. You look back at that time and you realize there's something, someone, some power that is guiding you through it. That's the meaning of the Holy Spirit, the power in our life we cannot see, but we can feel it moving us through our lives. Bishop Will Willman says the work by God has a name, the Holy Spirit. As it is the self-assumed task of God in Christ to speak to us and show us the way to receive our sins, to intercede for us, to die for us, and to rise for us. It is the work of God in the Holy Spirit to initiate faith in us, to nurture faith, and to bring faith to its full fruition. The Holy Spirit is God's perfecting what God begins in us through the Holy Spirit, and what God shall finally bring to complete fruition and final consummation in us is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's one thing to say you believe there is a God. It's quite another to believe that God is there for you. There are for too many reasons. Reasons having to do with who we are as sinners, who God is as holy and righteous, that we cannot come to God on our own. We must bring or be brought to God by God. In a parable, Jesus said the good shepherd sought the lost sheep and he found it put the sheep on his shoulders, brought the sheep back home. Jesus shows little interest in what the sheep thought of the whole affair. Salvation is God's work, seeking and saving the lost, bringing us home. The Holy Spirit makes that possible. With all Trinitarians, we believe in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit to the glory of God the Father. How can people like us come to a saving knowledge of Christ and a saving ability to follow him, it's only by the work of the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, enables us to truly encounter Christ in our reading of Scripture, which is often so distant from us, that is, the living God is made present to us through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit produces Scripture, enlightens us in our reading, hearing, and enables us to perform Scripture. And miraculously, when we read it, Christ stands among us, present through our reading and hearing of mere words. There's no way we could accomplish such a feat on our own. So we pray, Lord, 
open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that as the word is read and, and proclaimed, we might hear your words today for us. The Holy Spirit's work invokes deep feelings in us as individuals. In those wonderful moments, while listening to a sermon or reading scripture, we say, I get it. It's also a communal or corporate thing. Take today's lesson from Acts, the lesson we always read on this Sunday, the account of the first Pentecost Sunday. The Holy Spirit descends like fire on a whole group of apostles, forming these strangers into the church. Something, it, there is something about this spirit that gathers this crowd, overleaping barriers of race, language, gender, class, and makes a new community. So speaking of baptism, we say we are made Christians by water and the Spirit. The Holy Spirit forms the church out of nothing, not as most human communities are formed through class affinity or self-interest or economic location. We're formed by the work of the Holy Spirit. And like the Holy Spirit hovered over the dark waters at creation and brought forth a world out of nothing, the church, our church, right here this morning, is therefore a human gathering that wouldn't be here and certainly would never survive without the work of the Holy Spirit. If you're here in the church listening to scripture and getting something out of it, trying to be a better follower of Jesus, we believe it's because the Holy Spirit put you here. You think you're here this morning because you really wanted to be here. Perhaps you're sort of wanted to be here, but I believe your presence here this morning, despite all the perfectly good reasons for you to not be here, is a testimony to the enlightening, prodding wind of the Holy Spirit breezing through your life. I think you'd have to say it's the nature of the Holy Spirit to provoke and enable change. The Bible speaks about change most often through the word repentance. Repentance means literally to turn around, to be transformed into the person God intended you to be. And on the day of Pentecost, when Peter asked is asked by the crowd, what must we do? He says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ so your sins may be forgiven and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repentance, turning from our outward sins, is a lifetime process. We never get so adept at worshiping and serving God that we no longer need to repent. Daily, said Jesus, we're asked to take up our cross and follow, and daily we're let go of the crushing burdens that the world puts on our shoulders so we might take up the burdens Jesus has in mind for us. Sin is so deeply rooted in our wills and thinking only a lifetime of God's work in us can root it out. The good news is that through the work of the Holy Spirit, we keep turning, and God isn't done with us yet. The church ought to be that sort of community whose work is so risky, whose mission is so bold, that those that whose success is so unimaginable that the church will fail utterly unless the Holy Spirit empowers it to be that which God calls the church to be. The active church never stops creating things new. That includes us. We never walk away from encounters with this God Fortunately, God does not mean for us to be changed, converted, renewed on our own. The Trinity doesn't mean for us to be anything on our own. God gives us the Holy Spirit as a means to a new life. For instance, most of us are conditioned to think of prayer as something we do. Prayer is what we say to God. But what if prayer is meant to be considered more conversational? What if prayer is mostly what God says to us? When we pray, we're attempting to put ourselves in that location where God can get to us, which may be one reason why we don't pray more often. It's the nature of the Holy Spirit to work through multitudes of means to make God present to us, to give us not only the presence of God, but the power of God to work in us. Jesus promised just before he left that he would send us his Holy Spirit and he would be with us in a different, dynamic, empowering, disrupting way. He promised us not simply vague spiritual presence, he promised us his presence. You recall that when Jesus was with us along the road in Jerusalem, he was often with us in a disruptive way, disrupting perceived notions about God, dislocating us from our 
the customs, locations, constantly moving us on to some challenging, sometimes frightening place. And the promised presence of Christ, that dynamic descent of the Holy Spirit could have occurred elsewhere in another time and place than a religious meeting. There seems to be something about the Holy Spirit that loves to descend and disrupt church meetings. And that's the Pentecost promise. God refuses to leave us to our own devices. We don't have to be church by ourselves. And the Holy Spirit gave birth to the church, the wind and fire, and the Holy Spirit continues to inspire and prod and birth the church in a holy wind, life-giving fire. So the church is the place that values tradition, continuity, stability, and order. And most of us come to the church to be at peace. Most people are age treasure places of quiet and serenity, but the spirit is intrusive. It's unexpected. There's the sound of wind, the place lights up, and our earnest orderly meetings disrupted by a power that descends on us and comes out of nowhere taking us somewhere we had no intention of going. The only thing that keeps our church from being just another gathering of another group of polite but uninteresting, congenial but boring people is the possibility of this periodic disruption by the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. One of my favorite Pentecost Sunday sermon starters comes from the opening of the worship service at the Memphis Annual Conference in Tennessee. Richard Kirkhoff from Germantown, the United Methodist Church, stood up at the beginning of conference and says, Welcome to Pentecost. It is time to open up the mind-blowing, heartwarming, life-changing power of God. The power of God can invade the body, inflate the mind, swell the soul, lift the spirit, and make us more than we ever imagined. It'll make you young when you're old. It'll make you live even when you die. The power and presence of the Spirit will disturb, delight, deliver, lift. When God sends forth the Spirit, the whole faith, face of the earth is renewed. When God sends forth the Spirit, chaos is changed into creation. The Red Sea opens up to a highway of freedom. When God sends forth the Spirit, the young woman says yes, and Jesus is born. And life is never the same. When God sends forth the Spirit, amazing things happen. Barriers are broken. Communities are formed. Opposites are reconciled. Unity is established. Disease is cured. Addiction is broken. Cities are renewed. Races are reconciled. Hope is established. People are blessed. And church happens. Today, the Spirit of God is present. And we're going to have church. So be ready. Get ready. God is up to something. Discouraged folks, cheer up. Dishonest folks, fees up. Sour folks, sweeten up. Closed folks, open up. Gossipers, shut up. Conflicted folks, make up. Sleeping folks, wake up. Lukewarm folk, fire up. Dry bones, shake up. And pew potatoes, stand up. But most of all, Christ, the Savior of all the world, is lifted up. Pastor Bruce Pure puts it this way. He says, as I see it, the Holy Spirit is graciously and unobtrusively busy all over the place. The quiet helper, the unpretentious friend. The helper is quietly at work in the sincere concern of a friend for our health and those who take a stand against injustice, in the grace of folk who get the second, go the second mile, in the inner resources we discover at times of crisis, in those who dare to go against the tide of popular opinion, in the grace that enables us to admit when we're wrong, in the resilience of people who fight for the rights of others, in those who surrender some of their rights for the larger good, in times when we share the gospel in spite of our inadequacy, in finding joy in unexpected places, in taking responsibilities that we once thought beyond us, in refusing to let the greed of society take over our soul, in giving thanks always, even though the hard times happen in life, in rising above past failures and putting past hurts behind us, in finding a central core of peace in the midst of turmoil, in daring to laugh in situations where some would curse 
and knowing ourselves to be children of God and knowing others loved even when they have been very unlovable. Now Mahoney told a story of her personal life, a Pentecost experience that touched my heart. Nell and her husband Ralph had two sons. Their youngest son, Rick, was in a terrible accident when he was 21 years old. For five days, they walked the floor of the hospital in Chattanooga, hoping to pray that Rick would make it. And for five days, the doctors were encouraging. They thought he'd pull through. But then things turned the other way, and tragically, Rick died at 21 years. Nell's husband, Ralph, was a pastor of the largest Methodist church in the city at the time. When the memorial service was held the next Sunday afternoon, sanctuary was jam-packed. The whole city was in grief. The next morning, Nell Mahoney went to church all by herself. Her husband was in the pulpit. Her older son had gone back to college. Before the accident, Rick had been living at home, going to a local school. He always went to church with his mom. He always sat next to her, but now he was gone. Nell went to church that morning all alone. She said walking into church by herself that Sunday morning after Rick's funeral was the hardest thing she had ever done in her life. Just before she entered the sanctuary, she prayed, God, please be with me. Please be with me. Please give me the strength I need to do this. God, be with me. She walked in, sat down in her usual spot, and out of habit, she moved over, left to place on the aisle, the place where Rick always sat. She looked at the empty spot. It was almost unbearable. She felt so alone. And just then, there was a movement beside her. A little nine-year-old girl slipped in to that seat. The little girl reached over and held Nell's hand all through the service. And every once in a while, the little girl would pat Nell's hand and say, I love you, Mrs. Mahoney. I love you. Nell said she felt the presence of God. Many times in her life, that morning when she needed him, he was there. He was with her in the spirit and love and thoughtfulness of a nine-year-old little girl. Telling that story, now Mahoney showed us that she had a healthy relationship with God, a relationship built not on fear or guilt or self-interest, but on doing your best and trusting God for the rest. It's also the kind of trust St. Peter had when he stood up to preach on that first Pentecost and said, God, help me. God, please, please be with me. And God was with him. And God's spirit blew on that place and he gave Peter the right words to say and the courage to say them and 3,000 people were converted that day. Peter did his best and trusted in God for the West. So the question is, do you trust God like that? Do you, do you have a healthy, lively, vibrant relationship with God built on that trust so that when you, you know that you do not have to do it all on your own? You trust the Holy Spirit to take it from there to get you through. Sometimes it happens through a nine-year-old little girl who doesn't know any better. God's spirit is still alive. It's moving us beyond where we think we can go. And we are a witness to the world how powerful that spirit is. Amen.